going to hit cloud record and then we are live and I'm going to say boy oh fucking alert we've got a a horde of vicious boils here screaming for raw meat and we're just trying to keep them on a leash at the moment and we're going to talk about um basically we're going to rip into the iliad but we're going to rip into the iliad in a very very specific slant we're going to take a long Jungian lens to it and um this has always interested me, something I wanted to do in depth, but I've never justified it to myself that I sort of tear apart this, this book from this perspective before. But recently I've been getting into like, you know, the, the, the myths in a sort of new angle. I've been looking at religion in a new way after, I don't know, doing all the stuff I do on YouTube. It just gives you a new perspective over time. And I've, I've started seeing things in um, Greek mythology that I haven't noticed before. And I really want to explore them today. So what we're going to do is go through the first book of the Iliad. So the Iliad is made up of like a load of different books. And um, the first book is brilliant because it covers like so, so many massive themes. And basically it ends with uh, all the gods up in heaven, well, up in uh, Olympus, chilling out, like drinking, essentially drinking uh, a, a sort of magic mushroom co cocktail. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, it covers so much that it goes to show you how such a simple story can be the foundation for so much thought. Because as I was saying to the boyos before it kicked off, um, Greek myth is like the foundation stone for psychology in many ways. The words like the Oedipus, Oedipus complex, Electra, narcissism, archetype, ion, these are all Greek words from Greek mythology. And these are all words Freud and Jung used in order to create this. And the more you read into Greek mythology, the more you discover that it is one of the most razor sharp um, psychological systems I've ever seen in my life. Like, uh, there's, there's, um, I, I've done a couple of videos on this stuff, for example, the, the one with uh, Labyrinth and Daedalus and the way that you can create this like very complex maze and then get yourself trapped in it. That's the story of Daedalus and the Labyrinth. Like that's such a good analogy for the, the engineer kind of left brain overthinker type that I most certainly am. And it's uh, baked really deeply into that really ancient myth. And it's fantastic. So I want to rip into this. And the Iliad, it turns out to be one of the best places you can do this because it's so viscerally potent that you get to cross-reference all of this stuff in a brilliant way. So um, I was going off this, this is just this PDF in the internet. <laughs> I don't have like a translation. I know if this is in any way serious and academic and I wasn't wearing a fucking hoodie <laughs> like talking crap and uh, worrying about my mother charging or something, I'd be saying academic papers, but instead I've got like, uh, I've got this, this link to this website. There's a, there's a audio version on another website I haven't vetted. So if something weird happens, I don't know. And Troy the movie is actually a very, very, very good way for you to check this out because it is a um, fantastic fantastic introduction into this and um, it gives the story really well now one thing though is a uh, Troy movie is absolutely terrible for depicting the gods they just they sort of turn it into like a Richard Dawkins version of the book yeah. they completely rip out the gods and you'll see what I mean if, if you know the film and uh, we're going to cover all that stuff today so that's basically the the, the boyo intro the boyo intro is the best I could I'm here with um, a lot of boyos today and some of them may be speaking up but the main boy I'll be talking to here is a man called Laz and I guess I better introduce Laz because he should be showing up a, a bit more in the future but uh Yes, yeah, hello, we'll boyos. Hello, boyos. Good, good to be here. I'm really excited about the Iliad. We all love the Iliad, and I think we'll be able to shine a light on the topic from a few novel angles, at least I hope. Yes, and we'll be spiraling into paganism. Laszlo will be taming us to the civilized light of Christ as well. He is a uh, very much a Catholic, and he uh, makes sure we won't go drift too far into the the bloodthirst, the the barbarism of Achilles. It, and um, it really shows yeah, you we'll where we'll get yeah, it. yeah, it really shows you where the world is now. Because me as a Hungarian barbarian, <laughs> a horse lord, I have to impose the Christian order, which is yeah, which, I'm right. <laughs> should make uh, you think. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure about that at all. Like, what's happening? What's happening? No, we'll see. We'll see. Well, maybe you'll read this and something deep in you will wake up and scream for something out of it. Yeah, um, well, I'm not holding my breath, but... <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's rip into it. Let's rip into it. So, we, a few boyos who've, who are here may have uh, been when myself and Lazo did a class on this a while ago, but I'm going to go in, like, way more depth with this. But before we go into more depth, we do need to cover the beginnings as always, again. And um, the first line is just such a perfect place to start. Sing, O goddess, the anger of Achilles, son of Polisus, that brought countless ills upon the Achaeans. Now, if you were to read this in the sort of normal way that most people read, in the sort of derp modus, like entertain me book, you're going to get nothing out of it. You're going to get absolutely nothing out of it. In order to read properly, you need to spark your imagination in one sense. And then you also need to do a sort of critical thinking. Like reading can be this way of 
training yourself to think properly. Nietzsche himself said this. You need to be able to learn to see what these people are saying. So we have this problem where we'd read this and, and say, oh, you know, the, the, he, they're talking about Achilles being angry. That's exactly the same experience that I have when I'm angry and whatnot. And so the, in order for us to break this down, we need to like rip into all this and get to understand what the Greeks mean by anger. Now, you've obviously heard me talk many times on the Uber Boyo about like uh, reframing the way pagans understood anger and understanding their sort of mythology that they built around this. And when you start doing this properly, when you start looking at these lines and trying to see what they're actually saying, it starts to open up, quote unquote, these ancient religions in a fascinating way that really shows you the coherence of what they're trying to say. So first of all, before we get into all that, I want to give you a visual because these Archaeans, these are the main characters. Now, they're, they're called long-haired Achaeans. They're basically, you just imagine Led Zeppelin running around with swords, uh, killing people. Like, that's basically what we've got going here. And Achilles is like uh, Robert Plan, like the big blonde-haired crazy bastard on the, who's the front man and who's the, who's the most dangerous for doing that. And uh, this is just for the, all the Irish boys that are listening. The, da, I think they call them Danans. The people who, uh, the gods in Ireland, the people who invaded Ireland and took it over and turned themselves into gods, they were called the, the people of Danans. So I don't know, there's a little bit of trivia you can look into yourself. But um, what, what you obviously see first is the anger of Achilles. This is a very, very big theme because one of the huge themes in this is passion. The Greeks were brilliant in their ability to paint passion as tragically valuable. It passion, what's going to happen with Achilles is he's going to let his passion control him and that's going to destroy him. But there's actually something beautiful about that. And that's such a complex and difficult idea. Like I can just say it abstractly to actually to feel that is such a, such a big deal and whatnot. And so this is like the, the anchoring theme with it. Now, the, the way you can start seeing the way Greeks saw mythology and how this works with um, their, their whole conception of the world is when you look at the next line, it says many a brave soul did it send hurrying down to Hades, and many a hero did it yield a prey to dogs and vultures. It is the anger. So they're now giving the anger a sort of power, a sort of personification. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because the more you get into Jung, the more you start to see something very weird about Freud and Jung. Like, you think you're just a boyo, which is like, I'm me, you know? Jung, Freud, when they say, no, no, you've actually got like, got like this ego which is one part of you and then you've got this like id or this this deep self which is another part of you and then you've got this other character like your anima or something like that and he starts to say your mind is split up into many different pieces and that's kind of scary right does that mean i'm schizophrenic and you kind of think about it, it's like oh maybe i am maybe that's what's going on but the more you inspect your experience the more you see something like this anger is like something outside of you it's like a force outside of you that emotionally moves you and whatnot and you start to see that your mind is split up. Now, the way we understand this experience, because it still happens to us, we use things like psychology in order to explain it to ourselves. But the Greeks used their mythology as their worldview in order to explain to themselves what's happening to them. So this was a coherent way of distributing their personality in the world. And so Achilles would understand himself as his anger is a, a moving force and whatnot. Now, it's a very complicated idea, but I'm going to paint this over the course of what we're going to talk about here today. And so another massive, massive theme that comes from the first one is the next line. For so were the counsels of Zeus fulfilled from the day on which the son of Atreus, king of men and great Achilles first fell out with one another. So Zeus here. Is, is starting to bring in this idea. This is the big G. This is the big God. And he has this power to, he, he, it's almost like he's decided how the chess game is going to go before it's happened. So there's this weird determinism about it. And this becomes a very, very interesting theme because the whole way that the Greeks saw the world and the, the, the nature of the game, you probably hear Shakespeare say, all the world is a play. Well, this is very much coming from this where the Greeks believe literally that we are playing things for the gods entertainment and they orchestrate all these little patterns for some reason and it's it's kind of a confusing question it's like what do I do with my my, my emotions like how does it all connect this and you, you've heard me talk about Christianity in that like God has a plan for a heaven a utopia and Satan has a plan for a hell and me and Jimmy were talking about this and then um Christ is like the conscience saying go to heaven boy and Satan is like the evil impulse is telling you to run down to hell and whatnot and that's that's showing you this sort of idea that there's a superordinate plan 
getting orchestrated in the idea world and that your emotions actually connect to that. And they very much had the same, same thing going on here as well. So with that briefly covered, I'm going to rip into it a bit more. Has anybody got any, any, anything they'd like to ask or anything to touch on? Any ideas, no? Uh, I'll just uh, uh, maybe sure. mention. Um, so actually, I have another translation, which is the, the Fagel's translation. And I think like the word anger, I think the original Greek more resembles the word rage. You know, and we spoke about this in the, in the last uh, Iliad session because uh, the Greek language is very expressive and sometimes those uh, you know, nuanced differences do matter a lot. And in this uh, first song of the Iliad, without going into too much detail, actually, this is what the whole book is built on. Like that's the first chapter, so to say. It's the rage of Achilles. That's what everything is connected to. And rage is a little different than anger though. Rage is something that just you know, burns and destroys. And the whole first passage is about that, like the destroying force of the rage of Achilles. But the big G, Zeus, already shows up in the context that his will is moving towards an end in which the rage of Achilles is embedded, you know? And yeah. it just shows you that I'm, I'm literally like eight lines in, in the poem. And we're hitting on like massive truths yeah. about yeah. human nature and the world and myth and religion. And this is how these works should be approached. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just the dramatic effect, but literally after a few lines, these are things that most people live their lives without even noticing or even becoming aware of, you know? So uh, that's just it, really, just to uh, address the magnitude of the of the. Epic. That, that, that's such a great point as well, because um, Nietzsche called um, Homer the educator of the Greeks. And it's kind of weird for us to think that it's like he, he said, like, you know, two poems and they're not even that long. Well, they are long, but they're like, you know, it's two books. Imagine basing, you know, an entire civilization off two novels written by some mad boy out there last year or something like that. It kind of be a bit insane. Like you're kind of like, what's going on here? But when you dig into this stuff, you see it's just jam packed with these massive themes. Like, as we said, in this first line, you've gone from the most fundamental individual experience which is the anger and frustration with the nature of reality and you've gone to the master of reality all in it as well and this all all this stuff is coherent to these greek people these pe people would have needed to learn this stuff this is the same way that you would go to church and get and get taught these quote-unquote archetypes if you will and that's something that we're really going to come down to quite a lot is that a lot of this stuff maps onto your personality in a way that will make you understand a lot more what young meant by archetypes you know he like zeus is the filling the archetype of god and for all we know he could be the same thing like I, i'm almost certain that it is and this is just the greek lens at looking at it and we've um we've got to get into that a little bit more we'll see it now and, and, and also, ju just a quick note that actually the contemporaries of Homer, the contemporary academics, which were the priests, actually criticized his approach to the gods, which you know, at the end of the day, that was that tension between the artistic right. representations and the uh, prevailing institutions of the time, which is very interesting. <laughs> it's absolutely. And it kind of reminds me, Homer reminds me a little bit of um, Isaiah, because Isaiah <laughs> from the Bible comes up and like prophesizes and everyone was just like, I, I don't know, does he get killed? But mm. everybody obviously is a bit pissed off at him because he's yeah. telling them new stuff. But it's, it's that type of thing. Yeah, as you're saying, the, the artistic right brain creator is coming out. No, it reminds me, it reminds me of, uh, reminds me of uh, how when Virgil wrote the Aeneid, he was piggybacking off of a lot of the stuff we're talking about here. And his ability to connect kind of the Roman identity and kind of forge it into the destiny. You know, you had the foreshadowing of... Um, was it was it Mark Anthony? Who, who who was it that he came across in the underworld? I forget. Aeneas came I, across. But I, I don't know. I'm afraid it was I one know. of the it was one of the great Roman generals, like the children of Emperor Augustus at the time, and it was so powerful that Emperor Augustus wanted to keep the Aeneid. It's like, yo, this is going to be our Iliad. We want yes, this to be our yes. Iliad. We're going to use yes. it to help justify the mythology that we're going to use to expand our empire. So it was so powerful. Yes. Even at that, you know, the, the later empires would piggyback off of it too. That, and that's that's a fantastic point as well is that like these these things seem trivial they seem kind of cool but when yeah. you think what's going on here is that a narrative can form the foundation for empires like how does that even make sense but i guess psychological coherency is the essential thing for an empire and so whatever your your archetypical stories are is is almost like what holds everybody together in the same mental space and that's a very complex idea but it's um, an, an absolutely huge one
So to rip into Achilles, and this, this is, this is uh, where we start getting juicy. Um, okay, and so what happens, basically, to, to skip some of the plot, because I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar, familiar with the plot. Basically, this, this starts with um, Achilles and Agamemnon. They're, they're having an argument, basically. So the Greeks, the, the, the invading Greeks are having an argument. They're, they're bickering as they're invading Troy. And so what has happened is they're after running into Troy with the big walls and, you know, the Trojan horse and all this. And, and um, they're after messing around with Apollo and Apollo took care of Troy and we'll get into all that stuff later. And they've pissed Apollo off. And this is actually quite good because we're currently going through a plague and the God of plagues and health is Apollo. And Apollo strikes down the Greeks the, in the Iliad at the very start with a plague. He like cast them down. So we can, we can rip into all that now in a moment, but um. They're, they're in this situation and Apollo is making them all sick. And so the question becomes, all right, what exactly is going on here? This is again where we get into the, the, the gods a little bit. I'm going to rip into Apollo a lot later, but God is this, um, Apollo is this God of order, of, of health, and he has the ability to cause plagues. He's the God of idealism. We're going to talk about this a lot now. Whereas the Achaeans kind of come into this and their intention is to destroy their intention is to go in here and take the lovely walls made by the Trojans and tear them down. The, the Achaeans have a bad intention, you know, and Apollo is all about building things up. Apollo is all about, you know, architecture, the God of classical music. You could think of it that way, the God of, of a mastery and whatnot, the God of perfect, the, the, the desire in us to create beautiful and perfect things to shape everything perfectly. And what happens is these Achaeans come in pissed off and they want to pull it all down. Troy is this magnificent city and these guys want to rip it down. And then um, this is actually very interesting because later on, as um, Greek Boyo brought up, the, the Romans even looked back to this. I and mean, that's, there's a huge part of this as well that we'll talk about. Like the Romans believed they were the Trojans and the, the Apollonian attitude of the Romans was to always build and craft and get civilized and cultured like Apollo. Whereas uh, you have Achilles and the Achaeans coming in destroying and the Romans even saw Achilles as like a barbarian as like a, a crazy, destructive, degenerate barbarian who was uncivilized and whatnot. Um, and this speaks a lot to the nature of, uh, for example, anger. Like this is something interesting you hear about paganism where it's like, oh no, this is, this is, it's, all, it's all about being angry and obeying your emotions and whatnot. And it was actually extremely frowned upon um, by, by many quote unquote pagan cultures. Like I think what's so brilliant about this, this story is that they're trying to justify and, sh and just show, not, not moralize, but just show Achilles passion as what it is and understand that it's like this powerful force of nature and it's rare to see someone release this out and so in order for us to think about this properly i always use the metaphor of imagine the terminator have you ever seen the film the terminator in the 1980s so you kind of have to think of achilles like this because imagine me or you were like this peasant so we don't ever have any armor we aren't really that good at using swords we might have like rakes or sticks or something and then this trained like martial artist shows up and he's coated in bronze. So he's literally like made of steel, like a robot. And he's walking around and he has this like cold, angry glare. And he's going around just killing everything. Like he's just a cold blooded murderer. And he seems to have this pure, ghostly, otherworldly intention to just take life. And it's very, very hard to understand. And imagine what that would be like. That would be like a lion walking into your little, uh, your little hen house or something like that. And you would be scuppering away or it'd be like Odin showing up in your monastery, like one of those things. And it's, um, it's, it's an important thing to capture with this because it's, it's hard for us to, to, to really understand how, how frightening people like this might have been in the ancient world. Like now we have guns. So, so physical prowess ain't that big of a deal. But back then, like being able to fight is a big deal. And if you could do it well, and if you had the money to get the armor to back that up, you would be like a different, you would be like a, a, a cyborg. You, I know a lot of people are really worried about, um, you know, for example, if someone got rich enough, they could turn themselves into like this AI super transhuman. This guy sort of was one of those. This guy was like this lording monster who, who, who obeyed, who took crap from no one and went around and like smacked people up because he was just so, he was just so above them in terms of relative power, that type of thing. Um, and so this is where you start to get a sort of insight into just the viciousness of this person, the viciousness of his heart. As we said, Apollo is all about like structure and building the big palace, you know, making the little castle of sand. And Achilles is like the, the furious anger that wants to wash it away. Achilles says, I'll cut the throat of a dozen sons of Troy in all their shining glory, venting my rage on them for your destructions. And 
and then a dozen brave sons of the proud Trojans he hacked to pieces with his bronze. Achilles' mighty heart was erupting now with slaughter. He loosed the iron rage of fire to consume them all. And in order to understand what Homer's trying to get at here is he's trying to paint the vivid viciousness, the insanity of this, like a metal bloodthirsty lion, that type of thing. And it is an absolutely profound thing to really get into your head. If you can, if you can sit down and read this properly and imagine you right now, as you are, not, not, no guns, just a little like fireman stick, and one of these guys shows up and says, um, says what's going to go down. So uh, any thoughts on this, gents? Any, any, any riffs you'd like? No. Actually, I, I, I just have like a, a sentence maybe with, and, and this might become relevant later on with the uh, Girardian thread, if we actually yes. get there, is that it's interesting to see how Achilles' rage behaves, like the, the uh, physics of Achilles' rage, that it's there. It, it's waiting to be unleashed. You know, it can be unleashed for someone's uh, destruction, like uh, because the king has some sort of a, a, a bigger campaign going on. But Achilles' rage is there. It's like this, th this force that's just waiting to be unleashed. It's not something that's necessarily being generated by the situation, you know? So uh, this might become interesting later on. It just... Uh, Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a fascinating and brilliant point as well. Is that, and so important to understand is that it's almost like um, Achilles is like on a leash. Mm. The gods are holding the leash and they're like waiting. They're sort of saying to themselves, they're like asking Zeus, when's the right time to let him loose? Because it's a, it's a weird thing. The Greeks are sitting there trying to understand, why do I have this anger? Why do I have this furious desire to kill people and become a, a ruler? Like, what is that? And that's a very complex emotion to deal with is your, your ambition to win, you know? Your ambition to dominate everybody else and win. That's a very difficult emotion to manage because it, it will make you aggressive and, and difficult to be around. And it will make you do stupid things. We're, we're going to come into that now in a moment. It'll make mistakes with that. It will force you to say stupid things and make enemies and whatnot. And if you're like very ambitious, you'll have a lot of enemies. And so you have to be careful how you manage it. And it's a very, very annoying thing. You're sort of saying like, why did you fill me with this for it to torture me? And why, when I trust it and when it works, it gives me this great victory. But it causes a lot of pain. Um, but sometimes when I trust it, it, it causes me to lose and causes me a lot of pain. Like what's going on here? What's, what's your way of doing that? So you can see how the Greeks are trying to figure out what's happening with themselves. And uh, then we get into Agamemnon a little bit. Um, Sons of Achaeus, he cried, all other Achaeans, may the gods who dwell in Olympus grant you the sack of the city of Priam. So uh, I think this is a wise boy who shows up. And this is um, after they, so they're, they're after raiding the beaches, the Greeks, and they've taken like a load of girls. <laughs> they went in, they, they took, they killed a load of people and they stole their girls. And one of these old lads comes up and he's like, give me my daughter back, lads. And he walks in and he says, look, if you take Troy, like I'm happy. May the gods give you Troy. Please just give me my daughter. Like, I'm a, oh yeah, I'm a priest of Apollo. Please just give me my daughter, you know? And um, so they're saying, free my daughter, accept the ransom for her in reverence to Apollo and the son of Jove. So the, Apollo is like the god of civilization. You can actually think of this a lot like the Vikings and, and the, the, the pious Christian Irish monasteries. And then the, the savage, you know, Vikings of the destruction coming in. It would be a very, very similar dynamic. You have Apollo as the god of civilization and, and Jove. Jove is Jupiter, is Zeus, is God. It's the same idea. And Apollo is like Christ. Is that a sort of Messiah figure of order? And there's like, you know, believe in order. Don't, don't be, be civilized. So do you understand why they're bringing this up here? They're saying in reverence to Apollo. It's like saying in the name of Christ, give me my daughter back. Like have some civility, have some, be human, you know, stop being a Terminator for a little while and just be a normal person. You see that mindset in uh, St. Augustine's The City of God, actually. The idea of, well, he compares the city of God, the Christian city, like in reverence to Apollo with the kind of the cities of Cain, the barbaric, even Cain actually in Genesis three, uh, his descendants take multiple wives too. This kind of barbarism contrasted with the civility of, you know, good Christian boyos, I guess. Yeah. Yes, most well, certainly. And like that, that's a very important dynamic to understand that then this is, this is something that comes up in Nietzsche as well. His, mm -hmm. Nietzsche's first book was Apollo versus Dionysus. That's the exact same dynamic here. The, the fine, um, it, it's known like the Europeans saw themselves as a Polian, the very, very, you know, rational, mathematical, 
head above the the clouds, uh, you know, civilized, like uh, up nose up at everything, versus the the sort of vivid, um, aggressive, bloodthirsty, passionate Dionysian experience of that that is sort of downwards and and into the darkness of feeling and smell and taste, the lower senses versus the Apollyan civilized vision and higher senses of hearing and vision that you can see over across the world and whatnot. And then Nietzsche says that this is a fundamental tension. And this is actually very, very interesting if you want to understand um, how quote unquote archetypes and gods are because at the top of um, Christianity, I guess you've sort of got Christ and Satan at the top of Apollo. You've got Apollo and Dionysus. Nietzsche paints the same picture. Norse mythology had Odin, who was the sort of Dionysian God of war and Tyr, who was the God of law and order. And we wasn't, he was sort of civilized. Like he was sort of the God, more, more civilized God in that type of sense. And so this is a very interesting dynamic because it's painting a problem that is the human experience, which is our emotions are Dionysian. They're aggressive. They demand something of us and we need to try to understand them. But at the same time, like <laughs> our reason, our, our higher selves build these beautiful things. And, and then it's almost like the forces of order and destruction and whatnot. It becomes very, very beautiful when you start seeing it this way. On this, the rest of the Achaeans with one voice were respecting the priests. So all the Achaeans were saying, of course, civilization. So Laszlo shows up with Attila and I'm like, look, we, we, we'll, uh, yes, we'll, we'll do all this. But then Agamemnon, so this is the big alpha male, you know. Agamemnon is like literally the hubristic guy who thinks he's God, that type of thing. Agamemnon spokes fiercely and says, uh, old man, let me not find you tarrying about our ships, nor yet come hereafter. Your scepter of the God and your wreath shall profit you nothing. I will not free her. She shall grow old in my house at Argos, far from her home, busying herself with her loom and visiting my couch. So go and do not provoke me or it shall be the worse for you. So that is a, so very lewd and naughty stuff. And it's basically him pushing back at the priest, at civility, at Apollo, at Jove, and at God. And we're going to start to see this. This is a very, very common team in Greek myth called Hubris and Nemesis. This is actually quite similar to Jung's concept of the shadow. It's like whatever goes up must come down. And it's central to the understanding of Greek destiny and myth. It's almost like everything must eventually balance out in the end. And so if you push too hard against the gods and fate and destiny, if you get too arrogant, you get a nemesis will arise and snap you back. And that's a huge theme, you know? That's a massive theme. Achilles himself dies from an arrow in his heel. And that's symbolic of that idea of if you push to become glorious and famous, you'll get remembered in the glorious, famous way. And what is more glorious and famous than the unstoppable warrior who died from a awkward, funny arrow is healed. That type of thing. It's the poetic irony of a, a lot of Greek myth and whatnot. So I'm going to roll on. Any thoughts? Uh, just one. And, I, and maybe I'm reading stuff into it, but why not? So uh, the, <laughs> the Greeks won after all, right? So um, it doesn't really change anything in terms of the outcome, but how it happened, it does. Because the outcome of this action of Agamemnon, well, this leads to an altercation between him and Achilles, which becomes really this frame battle that escalates. And this is why actually Achilles with, withdraws from the battle. So this is why Patroclus, his cousin or his friend, actually goes out and gets slain by Hector. And this, all this built up rage of Achilles just basically gets unleashed. And in revenge, he slays Hector, but not only slays Hector, but also desecrates his body. So what I see here is maybe like a, a loose sequence leading from a corrupted desire because look Agamemnon he could have just came and said that hey we're gonna like uh, fight an, an honest battle we're gonna you know take our prize but here we can see like his hubris kind of creeping in and unbeknownst to him he cannot foresee this it will actually result in the desecration of that great hero the tamer of horses Hector and it turns glory into something that's more ugly, you know, something that's disgusting. So I don't know, again, maybe I'm just reading into it, but you, you can kind of see how, uh, how this can unfold this way. I don't know what you boys think. I, I, th I think that's um, a great thing to pull in. Cause again, these, these are such common misconceptions about, um, 
like, you know, the paganism thing, people approach this with a very, very shallow attitude. It's like, oh, paganism uncivilized and bad or worse if they want to go into paganism because they want to, because they think it's cool. And they're like, oh, it's all about your feelings, bro. And actually like most of this stuff is layered with messages about humility and hubris because these are human universal. These are quote unquote archetypical, you know, like it's like Agamemnon's will to victory and glory causes him as many problems as it does victories and whatnot and even the story is framing Agamemnon as not a very admirable character in some sense it's not it's not as negative maybe as as it shows up in the film but he's still not like you know uh he's still not like uh he's not as as interesting as Achilles he's just an arrogant old dude who wants it all that type of thing and so uh it becomes he's almost like the tyrant archetype that type of thing and you'll see this a little bit more now later yeah. Um, also, at one point in the story, he actually recommends that they just go home. So, so, so he, he does break at one point in the, in the story, which is interesting. There you go. Every, everyone breaks, yeah. And I guess this is what's so important to understand is the reason why these stories work through them is, is it's explaining the drama of emotions. It's not really you know, telling much in terms of like what you should do. It's just sort of saying th- these, these characters are almost like personifications of your struggle. And this is why Greeks were so into tragedy. Um, Aristotle and Freud would talk about the idea of catharsis. That is when you watch something very sad that you, you actually recognize in yourself will cause you to cry. And that would actually free you in a weird way, It'll like unlock the neurosis. Cause you'll under, you'll understand and you'll feel, you'll empathize with, the fact that other people have gone through this. And it's a very, very interesting experience to suffer like someone else. So um, basically what happens is in in this Agamemnon is uh, insults Apollo. And it becomes quite an interesting theme because people would read over this, but I guess since we're in the middle of a plague, it's worth bringing up. Apollo is this God of order. And when you, now this, I'm going to get into this very deeply, but when you offend order, when you go against, shall we say the logos, and I'm, I'm not sure how many of you uh, follow a lot of Christian stuff, but the logos is almost like the universe is built with a, a set of mathematical principles that do work and you must obey them. And when you drift from them, what's going to happen is you're going to drift from life. Basically, you're going to drift from harmony, beauty and, and happiness. And Apollo is the personification of what happens when you obey that logos. He's absolutely the same as what Christ turns up as the same in some way. No, I, I will get murdered by slow for saying that, but it's, it's like <laughs> archetypically the same being, if you will. And then when that logos, you, you, you get, you're more harmonic, you're more, and literally more beautiful. Like it's, it's the idea of health and beauty, that type of thing. And then when you drift from that, you, you drift into sickness, you drift into disharmony, you drift into ugliness, you dif- drift into horror, you drift downwards, you drift into, you know, lesser beings. So Apollo is upright intelligent vision hearing and then this this more animal side of you will pull you down as you drift away from the logos into the fallen world if you will and so apollo is always trying to pull you out of this and so this is how he, he gets this personification of uh, sickness and the health bringer and whatnot. and he's a very complex god but um you you start to see that these archaeans are coming bringing chaos and disorder and so when they start getting sick they're all sitting down there being like well we're sort of the agents of chaos here so we can hardly like i'm not surprised that apollo the god of order has come around and made us all given us all plague because we're being fucking degenerates like running around trying to, to ruin his city like it makes perfect sense and that uh, we'll get into the arrows thing because there's there's so many interesting things about that as well later but basically um th- that that's that's that dynamic that's going on there and again it's an important thing to understand this seems very easy for us to trivially brush over and be like oh Apollo. they meant it as like a metaphor and all that but do you see what i'm trying to describe is that if you believe that there's an order to the world the logos and you personify that as jesus christ or as apollo that's that's not an incoherent way to start communicating to yourself the priest of apollo says guys you're going against order and civility you're going this is why the plague is here all of um, agamemnon's boyos are like bro like the reason why we're st- we're going against order. Like, no wonder it is a plague. Like, give him the fucking daughter back. Stop being a degenerate. Yeah, this type of thing. So it's um, an important motif to get in. Important if you want to understand perhaps what an archetype is, is whatever that thing is pointing at, at root, could be the, the foundational archetype. And maybe Apollo is the painting you put on top of that or something. So we'll talk about that more later. Um, for a whole nine days, he shot hours among the people. But upon the 10th day, Achilles called them in assembly. 
moved thereto by Juno. So that's a very interesting phrase again. Who saw the Archaeans in their deep throes and had compassion upon them. Oh, Achilles with compassion. Very fucking interesting. Then when they got together, he rose and spoke among them. Sons of Atreus, said he, I deem that we shall now turn roving home if we would escape destruction, for we are being cut down by war and pestilence at once. Let us ask some priests or prophets or some reader of dreams, for dreams too are of Jove. Okay, so again, there's a lot of stuff I want to go into this. Um, this will be something I'll bring up a lot more later. But again, it's the same motif that I'm trying to say. Look at how he outsources his compassion to Juno. Juno is the goddess that he uses to understand the concept of compassion. That's how he understands that emotion. That emotion is not like just compassion the way we understand it. That would be like us saying Mother Earth and her, her emotional feelings. So we'll get into that a lot more later, but that's a very, very interesting and fundamental part of understanding how the Greeks might have seen this stuff. They would have effeminized the, the, the goddess of compassion and, and compartmentalized it and used it as a tool to understand things. And um, then, as I said, yes, yeah, I've talked about all this. Zeus is the master architect. So we talk about dreams. Now, th there's this really weird, like Zeus, God, and this is a fucking hard thing for us moderns. Like we're all struggling with this right now, but God is this inaccessible super being that secretly orders the whole world. And he has like a master plan. And this little story here is about his master plan for Achilles and how Zeus figures out how to bring this plan to his end. So he knows what's going on and he's, he's planning this. And what he does is he actually communicates to the characters what to do through dreams. And Apollo is the one who brings them these dreams. Now, this is very similar to how a prophet or Jesus Christ or something like that shows up and tells them what's going on. Now, this is complicated for us moderns, but think of it this way. Um, for example, Rene Descartes, who came up with the theory of mind that we go on, got told by an angel in his dreams that nature shall be conquered with the use of number and measure. And it's that type of um, way that people talk about the imagination and the right brain is this magical space that brings you super knowledge. Like it's, it's, the, very, it's the same idea, man. It's the same idea. Do you know the way people talk about the DNA spiral being discovered from the psychedelic trips or something like that? They're like this is how they'd understand that. It's like, oh, Jove is giving me something. So they'd almost see their heads as these like portals. Um, maybe, I'm not even sure if it would be heads, but I'm going to go with their heads as these portals that like, Jove would, would put his, his will inside of them in order to tell them what to do. So when they start having this weird like, idea rising up out of their unconscious, as Jung would describe, so the Greek is walking around there like murdering people, and then so all of a sudden it bubbles up, and, and as Jove is like, or Apollo, or a dream is like, uh, maybe don't kill so many people, and, and uh, read some Gerard or something like that. What would happen is they're like, oh my God, God is trying to say something. Zeus is trying to say something. And Apollo is the, the, the sort of interpreter. And this is where you can start seeing stuff like oracles and all this starting to make sense. Imagine like me, all of us are probably very, very left brain intellectual people, you know, we're, we're um, engineer, like engineering types, that type of thing. We love, love little categories and all this. But imagine if you could completely just turn off your left brain and be your right brain entirely. So if, if you could do that, and imagine if you taught someone to do that completely. Imagine if you gave them drugs that blasted their left brain into oblivion. You know, what, what do you have there? You have someone who like speaks like there's some, <laughs> there's just some type of prophet all the time. And that's exactly what this would have been. Someone who's speaking from this other part of their brain. And they might've been understanding that that way. It's like, oh my God, this, this person has direct access to the spiritual world. And, and by all intents and purposes, they may be correct about it. You know, like we have characters like this, the, the intuitive type, the person who sees things very visually. Like I do have that side of myself, I believe, where I'm, um, I've got that like artistic visual side in some sense. And uh, I just imagine if you turned off the other side and let that loose, what would it be like? What type of way would it talk? And this would have been this understanding of what an oracle is and whatnot. And so again, as I'm, damn Apollo, uh, as I'm trying to say, all of this stuff is actually very coherent when you sit down into it. You see the way they're constructing their world and the way they're constructing their minds. And you can use this to look at your own mind, being like, well, what were these guys seeing in this stuff? And how am I conceptualizing it? Because if I was to say anything that I see wrong with the way modern people understand themselves is they think all they are is just the rational ego. And Freud and Jung and Nietzsche and all of them and the Greeks all come in and be like, oh, dude, the Christians as well. No, dude, you're not that. You're anything but that. That's the smallest part of you. And it's the weakest part. It's like an eggshell, you know? 
And, and when you crack that eggshell, because you're, you have no mythology, everything's darkness and you have to do what Jung did, which is go and write a red book. And that's, that's genuinely our, our kind of fucked up position is that we need to go in and, and figure this whole psychology thing out ourselves and feel in the dark. We have to rediscover what these guys already had. Whereas when their eggshell got cracked, they had all this stuff in place. Oh, that's, a, that's Apollo coming into me. All right. Ah, oh, yeah, all right. Oh, sweet. oh the, the emotion, the compassion. Oh, that's Juno. Oh, it makes sense, you know? And um, this, this is actually a very powerful position to be in because then you tend to be very coherent with yourself as a group. It makes you powerful. And then what happens is you get rich, you start to doubt, you start to dishonor the gods, and then you start to blank out that world. You get arrogant, hubristic, and then your society falls. This happened to the Greeks. When Christianity came in, they were going through a crisis because everybody just knew the gods were all metaphors. This sounds, sounds a lot like where we are right now. So, so maybe, uh, maybe Jesus is on his way back to be like, you fucking idiots. You always make this mistake, you know? No prophecies, blah, blah, blah. Never mind all that stuff. We'll skip Apollyon prophecies for now. But uh, any, any thoughts, gentlemen? Any boils? Any, anything you'd like to say? Any I questions? have a few. Um, I have a few thoughts. And actually, as I speak, Apollo is blasting out my eyes. But no, Lazo, speak I'll, carefully I'll, now. <laughs> I'll try and do my best. So uh, first, just a thought that uh, it's hard to understate the significance of the Greek heritage in terms of how Christianity de developed. So first of all, if you think about it, the Greek language. So the result of the campaigns of Alexander the Great in the spirit of Hellenism. So he spread the Greek language, and that was the single factor that actually allowed Christianity to spread, and it helped <laughs> the words to spread, uh, because then they didn't have to spend a generation learning local languages. They could just use Greek. So that's, that, that's one. And then also, like if you think about logos, so the, the ancient Greeks had this idea of, look, our strings are being pulled by these gods, these personified emotions, even, even if they didn't articulate it that way, but that, that, that's what it was. And, and these are persons, you know, with desires and, and powers and relationships. And we also have this other thing, which is the logos, which is not a personal thing. That's more like a force, you know, that's more like the ordering force of the universe. Cool. And then John the apostle comes, you know, sits down with them, you know, maybe they, you know, smoke the peace pipe, I don't know. And they get into this intense conversation <laughs> about the gods and the, and the nature of reality. And the Greeks tell him, you know, and then probably John already knew, but we have this thing, the logos. And John was like, look, dudes, like, take it like this. You have the logos, which is the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God and became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So it's like telling them that what you are thinking is not wrong. It's not like your whole religion is stupid. You got that thing right. You got the logos right. Like, well, fucking done. <laughs> that, that's quite an achievement. And then imagine that that thing who is God was also with God. You know, stay with me, stay with me. It also was God. And then the incarnation. And that was actually the gap. Because if you think, uh, think about it, that was actually a problem for them. They tried to kind of personify that order they i think they kind of knew deep down that it's something that they need to do for example apollo is a great idea but it just wasn't quite there because it was still like one of those gods like very much like humans very much fallen beings at the same time and there is this thing that's pure which is the logos and the whole incarnation i think in principle even just on a philosophical level is an attempt to kind of bridge the two which is a super complex thing. Um, so again, just a little trailer, a trailer for the Girardian conversation. <laughs> um, so that's, that's something I, I do want to touch on. Like, like it really, really important to understand is that uh, Apollo is this sort of transient figure. The way people understand Christ now, as he's like this metaphysical character that zooms in and out of dimensions and comes to meet you when you're facing problems and all that. And he, he comes to you in your feelings and whatnot. That's actually the way they saw Apollo. But the whole him being made flesh was actually a pretty big step for the Christians to suggest something like that. And that's, I think, um, where things really, really got interesting because it was about saying, like, he actually existed. Like, it, it literally, I guess they came to the Greeks and said, like, Apollo lived that type of thing and he lived as one of us 
And that's an interesting thing for you to think about because this is where this becomes complex. Like it's very hard for a modern to think that like, you know, someone just sat down and be like the logos Matt's turned into Jesus. And they're like, what? But if you kind of say something like, imagine they understood this character, Apollo, God, the light and all that. And they said, yeah, he, he turned into a person and we met him. And here's the book he fucking wrote. Like, well, he's the book he told us to write, that type of thing. And then it becomes a lot more interesting in that sense. And I guess what's so important is you got to steal, man, why these people did these things. Like, what, what were they going through? What, what made them understand this type of stuff? And Laszlo said something to me before that I found very, very important to remember is that um, Jesus is, is easy to love. And so mm-hmm. when, when you can engage your emotions that deeply with the divine order that holds the universe together, you're in a pretty good position. You can see why Christianity quite well, because like, it made you get of reality and truth. And that's a, that's a good fucking place to have your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> reality and, makes you hateful. That's how it is. Yeah, well, exactly. On, I on. think it's, yeah, I think it's a super important component because you can respect truth or revere truth, but as long as it stays an abstract, you can't love it. You can't really have like deep emotions towards it. And I think actually what the Greeks also tried to do that with Apollo, because Apollo is like, you know, beautiful. It's like the, the, the solar child or call, uh, call it whatever. But I think their problem, again, probably not articulated, was that, uh, or maybe it wasn't even a problem, but in light of Christianity, we can see that, uh, we can see that someone, something was missing because we're talking about the creator of the universe, the very nature and fabric of reality, the moving force of every atom and everything that ever was and ever will be. You know, Apollo in light of that is still more like just a cosmic hero. And they still had the conception of logos though. It just wasn't pers- uh, personified. So maybe you can think about it uh, entirely in a psychological uh, frame and, uh, and just think about it in light of the evolution of human consciousness that this thing was imminent. It had to happen. There were, it was like foretold by all these myths. It's like they just suddenly conceptualized of this ordering principle, this energy that runs through the universe and moves everything. It just kind of popped up. It's, it's kind of like a, a flickering light, you know? And, the, and, and I think the Christian ethos just breathed life into it. It's like, but this is how it became flesh and he died for you. And then you can't help but love this entity who died for the sake of you, who was thinking, thinking about you on the cross, you know? Again, we, this, is, this is as far as it can get from abstract. And we are still talking about the incarnation, which is a huge, huge topic. And I, I think in a way, this is also how Christianity was, was different. Again, building on what already existed in these wisdom traditions and then adding some, some magic ingredient. <laughs> the, the, the love, the love. <laughs> yes. um, to rip into, so to just explain Paulo a bit more in terms of that logos idea, because this is actually a massive idea. Um, to come from it from a non-Christian frame, because people load this too much with the kind of Catholic thing that's going on right now. They talk about logos and whatnot. And it's, it's actually a really important thing to get your mind adapted to. And what the hell do I mean by that? Is that you have to, if you want to have a, an education, if you want to build your mind in any way whatsoever, you need to believe that you are trying to adapt to reality. Because what happens is that if you believe that there is no reality and you just sort of make it up, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that. If you believe that you're allowed to lie freely, you, you, it's almost like you build up a lot of arrogance and you, you don't break your ego and humble yourself at all. And humility is like the key towards growth, I guess, is what you're saying. So for example, a fighter walks in and says he's the best fighter in the world, but then he steps in the ring and gets beaten up. That's his confrontation with logos and reality. That's actually a, a very different way than what a lot of people understand it. And so for that reason, like that's the anchor towards building your mind is a conception of truth and reality and whatnot. And then this, like this quote unquote Apollo, this archetype, this provides that way of understanding it. As we said, Jesus provides a way for you to love that, which is fucking powerful because it makes sure that you're not going to just be like, oh, sweet. Well, it's, it's nice, like, you know, technical thing that you can kind of do it. It's like, oh my God, this is the, the real deal and whatnot. And um, to get detailed about it, I've ranted about this a million times, but I find this fascinating in that I was often just ranting myself, not really thinking about this stuff too much. Um, to see passages like this, um, Apollo was Zeus's favorite son who had direct <laughs> access to the mind of Zeus and was w- willing to reveal his knowledge to humans. Um, 
and Zeus had a divinity behind human comprehension. That's why he needed uh, Apollo, and he was both beneficial and wrathful. So again, the reality is harsh and good, and people don't understand it. So they need someone like Apollo to show them what's going on, be it stuff like dreams. Think of it like the right brain or the order. The, the world sort of makes sense, but in a very difficult to understand way. And then that's how that's tied to the idea of music and all that. That's just beautiful. When I read this the first time, I was like, oh my God, of course. It's so obvious when you think about it. It's almost like you're hitting on some type of archetype. This is sort of what I'm trying to get here. It's like, this is a fundamental way of framing reality that tends to be reliably correct. Like it's hard to argue against the order of music. It just is there. And you look at ancient Greece, you look at Christianity, they all have this concept there. It needs to be there. It's an important thing. If you want to structure your mind, train yourself to this. Now, a play of the innate ability of humans to take the light in music is gift of Apollo and the muses. According to Socrates, ancient Greeks believed that Apollo is the god who directs the harmony and makes all things move together. So again, it's order. It's, it's that ability to be delighting in music. Animals can't listen to music. You can that's a fucking crazy thing, dude. And people say stuff like, what, what makes us different from animals is our reason. It's like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe it's our, our ability to move with God in that type of sense, move with the logos and whatnot. So very, very important thing. Um, enough riffing about, uh, riffing about Apollo. Jesus, I don't have too many of these left, but I have plenty as well at the same time. Enough riffing about Apollo. That really sets up what Troy represents. So Troy, Order, Apollo. The Archaeans come in, Achilles come in, and they piss Apollo off. Pa Apollo causes a COVID-19 situation, and then everybody's like fucked. And then Achilles and Agamemnon and already start bickering among each other. So uh, Agamemnon's like, no, I'm going to keep the chick. And uh, the priest of Apollo goes off and says, make more of a plague. Achilles comes in and says, give the girl back. You know, we don't want the plague here. And Agamemnon, being the big alpha male, says, all right, cool, give her back. Give me your girl. And this is where... Achilles anger gets triggered. This is where things get bad, right? And so I want to just talk briefly about classical virtue. We're going to read some of this. And um, so basically that goes down. Achilles scowls at him and answers, you are steeped in insolence and the lust of gain. With what heart can any of the Archaeans do your bidding, either on foray or in open fighting? I came not warring here for any ill the Trojans had done me, I have no quarrel with them. They have not raided my cattle, nor my horses, nor cut down my harvests on the rich plains of Pythia. For between me and them, there is a great space, both a mountain and sounding sea. We have followed you, Sir Insolence, for your pleasure, not ours, to gain satisfaction from the Trojans for your shameless self and for Melanus. You forgot this and threatened to rob me of the prize for which I have toiled and which the sons of the Archaeans have given me. Never when the Archaeans sack any rich city of the Trojans do I receive so good a prize as you do, though it is my hands that do the better part of the fighting. When the sharing comes, your share is by far the largest, and I, forsooth, must go back to my ships, take what I can get, and be thankful. When my labor of fighting is done, now, therefore, I shall go back to Pythia. It will be much better for me to return home with my ships, for I will not stay here dishonored to gather gold and substance for you." So a bit, of, a bit of a quote, all right, but bear with me. This is absolutely foundational for what we're trying to get across with the drama here. So I've set up this ideal. It's like everybody wants to be in touch with order. And this is something, this is a good critique against philosophy, idealism. I'm 100% guilty of this. And um, like Christianity, even Greek myth and all this. It's all good in fucking theory, man. But when, when Agamemnon tries to take your chick, you're going to get pissed off. And how do you manage those emotions is a big problem, is a big problem. And that's a Dionysian experience. And this is the tragedy of life is that it's never going to be perfect. You're never going to have it all solved. You're never going to be able to figure it out in theory. You're just going to have to go in and get ready and do it. And so what you actually need is a way to understand how to manage yourself through these scenarios like how do you make these decisions these these are monumental decisions these could cause achilles bowing out of this war could cost hundreds to thousands of lives of his, his own people 
Like it's, it's a very, very crazy thing, you know, like these are big decisions and whatnot. And, and think about it with yourself. It's like, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I know logos and all that. And then I go out and I meet someone who, 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 who doesn't quite believe in logos quite the same. And they, they, they offend the truth and I can get angry at them, but then they'll just turn away from me and be like, why are you, why are you being weird? Why are you getting triggered so easy? Like, it, what, what are you doing? And, and it, it's this type of thing in, in practice, your emotions are a difficult thing to wrestle with, a difficult thing to manage. So it is an interesting way to talk about the ego because too much ego, hubris and all that, that little eggshell um, is bad. Or maybe letting it get ahead of it turns you into Agamemnon. But Achilles here has a, a, has a well-managed ego. He has a, a very noble egotistical perspective. He's not willing to get dishonored. He's willing to give himself up to destiny so that he does not get dishonored. Now that's an interesting fucking idea because when you are in a position where you're going to have to make a decision and someone's going to take something from you, the reason why you will do the pathetic thing, the reason why you will submit and enter into a slavery situation is because you're afraid that they can take you. You're afraid of what you're going to lose. So think of it like Leonidas or the 300 when they're standing in front of the Persians and they say, I'll give you land. And Leonidas says, you can give me nothing. You can take my life. I'm not even afraid of that. I will never bow to you. All right. And that's interesting because that's, that's egotistical, but it's also not egotistical. It's a very, very interesting thing. He will not let his, his spirit, his will be dishonored, be broken and whatnot. It's a very, very ancient form of virtue that runs through Christianity. It runs through paganism. It runs through nihilistic moderns. It, it's just something that keeps showing up when people contact reality because that's fundamentally what it comes about is that if someone points a gun at your fucking head and says, submit to me or die, and you say, pull the trigger, you are finally free for the first time in your life. And you cannot intellectually figure that out. You cannot sit here. I can't sit here and say, I would say, pull the trigger in that moment. I don't know what I start crying. I, I don't know what would happen. No, none of us can know because you can't do that with your reason. The part of you that does that is something deeper and more powerful. And it's, it's almost like, I guess, perhaps maybe it's the ego. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's, it's about having this, your, your values in order or something like that. But it's, it's tied to your very aggressive, powerful feelings because that's a very aggressive, powerful moment when you're standing there and you're about to lose your life and you willingly accept it, that type of thing. And so this was what we could call something like classical virtue or warrior virtue. Still very applicable nowadays. Christianity and Christ teaches us this idea. St. Stephen named after myself and he dies telling the truth. He's one of the first martyrs. He's one of the first people to say Jesus was the real deal. They're like, get him, kill him. Just don't say that again. And he's like, I'm not going to deny it. And then they're like, well, stone you to death. And they're like, I'm, I'm not going to say he's not the real deal because he was. And so they stone, they kill him. And so you, you, can take, you can take my life, but you can't take my soul, that type of thing. And then it, that may seem trivial. It's a nice intellectual idea, but to do it in real life is a big deal. And it's foundational to this. Agamemnon comes up, cucks this guy, and Achilles says, no, 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 thank you, brother. I'm walking away from this. And Lazo's probably going to rip into that a lot. And do you want to do it now or do you want to do it later? Probably go for it now. You mean the, um, uh, the Giardia and stuff? right now oh, no uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that later then we'll get to that later oh, or, or, or 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 did you mean the the conflict between achilles and agamemnon uh because i was yes, thinking yes, i mean, yes, I mean yes. yeah because look that's a frame battle between the two of them maybe we can do it another time you know because i think there's a nice thread going on now with the emotions and mythology girardian stuff connects right into that i'm not sure if we'll have time but i think we can skip the the frame battle between the two rascals for now <laughs> Sweet. No, no rascal frame battles, right? I, I think we will have time. This is, this is pretty much last uh, four slides, five, four or five slides. It'll be all right. Um, okay, and then this is an important thing. Again, like, first of all, Achilles is the angry dude. That's not what's happening. Achilles has rage, and he gets triggered from time to time. But he actually seems, he comes across quite noble here. Like, that's actually a pretty fair argument. It's like, listen, dude, you're just like gaining everything and being a dickhead to us. Like, you kind of have to treat us with a bit of respect if you want to run a fucking army. Like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing, bro? And then this situation is when, this is so interesting, when um, Minerva, known as Athena, shows up. So a rage and aggressive energy is represented as Aries. That's the god of anger. It's literally like the energy, the same thing. Mars is the Roman version of this. Um, 
So what happens is Achilles is led by Mars. I guess you could say his ego defending himself. Self-defense, you know? Um, your your self-defense is to get aggressive, get angry. And what happens is uh, Agamemnon is being like, give me your, give me your girl, you little, you little golden hair that can look like, like give me your chick. And then uh, Achilles freaks out. And then what happens is Athena comes and grabs him by the hair and says, don't do it. Relax. Basically what's going on here. Minerva came down from heaven for Juno had sent her in the love she bore to them both and seized the son of Polisus, Achilles, with his yellow hair, visible to him alone. For the others, no man could see her. Achilles turned in amazement and by the fire that flashed from her eyes and once knew that she was Minerva, was Athena. Why are you here, he said he, daughter of the ages bearing Jove, to see the pride of an Agnon, son of Atreus? Let me tell you, and it shall be surely be, shall pay for this insolence with his life. And so he's saying, I'm going to kill him. And um, Athena's like, don't do it, bro. Don't do it. Don't do it. Again, very, very interesting. We, we have now the, the conscience, the, the long-term planning, the strategic mind of Achilles bursting in out of his own conscious, bursting through and being like, ego, Achilles' ego. Don't fucking do it, bro. Wait. Pause for a second. Now, again, that seems like like people would read this and be like, oh, the gods, or they, they believe that they lived up in heaven and all this. And I, I'm pretty sure they did. But their conception of what these archetypes mean is so much different than the way you understand it. Like we've been ruined by the sort of parody that atheism puts up of Christianity. That's not fair. Like wh- how these people saw this stuff does have a coherence to it. That's p- powerful. And so I've talked about Satan as the lust that tells you to, you know, get that prostitute or steal that money or lie. And then Christ is the little feeble conscience that's just whispering, being like, you know, you shouldn't do that. And you know this experience. I know this experience. You know this experience. Now, if you just take that exact same dynamic and map Christ as Athena and your lust as, as instead of Satan as Ares, you have what Achilles went through here. The exact same experience. And it's just mapped onto it different. And this is the way the Greeks got the name Athens for Athens loved strategy instead of aggressive impulsive energy in fact Ares the god of anger the parody of paganism was actually the most hated god of Zeus he's always got into fucking trouble because he couldn't control his impulses so again you're getting this coherence of long-term thinking long-term planning and whatnot um in response to the wise bow Agamemnon so this is all the same stuff it's it's um so this is again Achilles coming with that classical virtue. I should be a mean coward, he cried, were I to give into you and all things. Order other people about, not me, for I shall obey no longer. So it's that drawing that line in the sand and being like, you may be able to order my death, but this is this is the line here. You can take you can take my life. You cannot take my my soul, my will, and whatnot. Um, and this this is uh, tied into the ancient conception of justice. A lot of this is about. Um, this this sort of idea that the world has a balance to it and when you push the world is going to push back it's actually that's a very very simple idea when you push the world is going to push back and the more you scale that the more profound it gets but it's a very very same fundamental idea when you get hubristic you're going to get nemesis but again that's ideal it's like don't don't push against the world and that's what you'll get the moralists come in they'll be like don't don't you know don't do things and the reality is, is that you're going to have to push against the world. And so this is trying to give you a map of saying, you're going to push against the world at some point in your life, and it's going to be complex like this. And it's going to be difficult like this. And these are going to be the set of emotions you experience. You're probably going to get shot in the foot and die. And there's nothing you can do about it. But this is how you emotionally you got to deal with this stuff. Like, is it is it good to never push and be a coward? Is it good to bow when Agamemnon pushes against you? Should Agamemnon bow to Achilles? Obviously not. He should keep pushing and see where he goes. But expect to be humbled. I guess this is what he's saying. It's like, just expect this justice to come. The world is a savage place. And um, beautiful idea. I think you see this pushing back, actually. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember where. In Carl Jung's work, he talked about this, but I know, uh, I think he mentioned something like to the person who's poorly integrated himself, he might see the shadow qualities in his children. And that's part of the problem of the family tensions that you see as an individual, you know, because the parts of yourself that you neglected, your children who, you know, they absorb you, all parts of you, they might actually absorb the parts of you that, that, that you don't like. And so you see that play out across, you know, the, the Christian or the Old Testament idea of the sins perpetrating or the sins manifesting down seven 
generations and that kind of thing. So it's really interesting. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Like think of it this way, say, um, say a father is weak, his son will become weaker or his son might try to compensate by become an extra Achilles like, you know, and it's almost like Apollo, that ideal, like is, is, is incapable for us to reach logos. We can never quite reach. It's like the way I always say the laws of music exist, but I will never grab them and have them. I will always just get close and fall out of their grace and get close and fall. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful reality, but it's, it's a very hard thing for people to understand is that you cannot actually own these, possess these, understand these. You can only get close to them. And I noticed that people who truly, I would say, are godly, who truly actually have virtue in this sense, who truly seem like they're touching on the deep reality of the world, they use metaphors like this. They don't say, I understand reality. They don't say, I'm the best, I'm the most moral. They say stuff like, I feel close to God. Do you know what I mean? And this is what's sort of going on. And so if you really get, you, you get close to it, maybe your son would come and match that or something like that because you're close to the balance, but then if you fall out of balance, maybe if you get hubristic, yeah, things are oscillating. And that could take generations for it to work out. It's a very, very difficult thing. Um, so I'm going to rip into the, literally, I'm going to talk about the gods for a bit. This is going to be the end point. Any last questions before we rip into Olympus where they all get smashed on nectar, on ambrosia? No, no thoughts. So what happens then at the end of book one is uh, the Olympians, they go up to Olympus and they talk about the plan. They're like, all right, well, we've got a bit of an issue down here. We've got these uh, Achilles is pissed off. Athena just came down and said, whoa, don't do it. And so they're kind of sitting there to be like, all right, how, how are we going to figure this out? Um, and so this is Jove, Zeus, God, and Juno, Zupiter, Jupiter uh, sorry, Ju Juno is uh, the mother goddess. And I think it's I believe it's Hera in Greek myth. And um, they're, they're basically arguing with each other. And Juno is sort of arguing with Zeus. And this, this is always something that kind of confused me for a bit. Because I was kind of thinking like, like this, this, you kind of, you read this part. And as much as I'm like LARPing being like, you know, don't, you know, steel mannered and all that. When I read this part, I'm like, like God and his wife arguing up in heaven on a mountain. Like, I'm not too sure about that now. I'm not too sure about that. Is that actually going on? But the more I thought about it, the more I started to see, well, Zeus is obviously that unbending ultimate reality. That's, that's ruthless. <laughs> ultimate reality is fucking as much as people try dress it up and be like it's a good thing it's not it's ruthless man if you were in one of these wars and terminator achilles showed up and dominated you by the law of strength you'd be kind of like zeus what the fuck was that all about he just killed my whole family and stole stole my, my daughter like what, what's going on here like imagine the priest of apollo um but then i started to see juno as this sort of um characterization of human emotion or maybe just emotion or consciousness i'm not quite sure because if you paint Zeus as silent, dead, uncaring God, which is what reality appears like, as much as people try dress it up, reality does have this uncaring nature to it. And that's actually a good thing because it makes you humble. But it's hard for your head because you're like, where do, where do my emotions come into this? What's going on here? And I think that they outsource this into Juno. They put it into the goddess. Um, and that's the very, very traditional way of just seeing reality is like you have the stiff iron belief and will and laws of Zeus that will punish you if you drift. The, the God of the Old Testament, wrathful. And then you have Juno, which is the, 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 the loving, caring God of emotion, almost the personification, not even like she, the, the God of emotion, the personification of all your emotions. And so she actually really like cares about Achilles because he's a passionate dude and she gets his struggle. And it's almost like when we look back at history we can see the sort of you know objective reality of zeus but at the same time if we look at juno's lens we would see the emotional struggle that's going on to it you can think of it perhaps the way you do politics now where you have the right wing which is sort of hierarchy and stiff laws and preserve the constitution and then you have the left wing which is emotions and feelings and whatnot it's maybe a, the similar archetype showing up again I'm not, I'm not quite sure and then it becomes a very very interesting idea christianity makes it extremely interesting as well because they turn god into the god of love and he's like a personification of both but um you see what's going on with these guys is that they're sitting there and it's almost like the 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 the, the sense the, the 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 outcry of humanity against zeus that's what's sort of going on with these scenes 
yeah, Juno. So, and as well, Zeus is so funny. Zeus is complaining. He's like, oh, for fuck's sake, I'll have to trouble you. If you set me bitching with Juno, she will provoke me with her taunting speeches. So you can imagine it's like all of humanity as his wife just being like, what the fuck are you doing, man? You're killing us all down here. And it's just like, I'm literally, I'm trying to run a universe up here. Leave me alone for a bit. Like, what are you doing, bro? Or like, wife, what are you doing? And uh, he even like speaks to her in that type of sense. Um, so let me see. Now there's, there's, this really, uh, there's this really powerful sentence that's going on as well at the immense part. So not one of them dared to remain sitting, but all stood up as he came among them. There then he took his seat. But Juno, when she saw him, knew that he and the old merman's daughter, Silva for Thesis, had been hatching mis mischief. So she at once began to upbraid him. Trickster, she cried, which of the gods have you been taking into your counsels now? You're always settling matters in secret behind my back have you never told me if you could help it one word of your intentions juno replied the sire of the god of men you must not expect to be informed of all counsels you are my wife but you would not find it hard to understand that oh yes all right so i, I read the wrong paragraph basically what's happening there is um that's that's a that's an even more interesting dynamic zeus has this habit of banging human girls <laughs> so <laughs> so juno is always like stop <laughs> i'm your wife stop and then um, as much as I'm talking about her, perhaps as the archetype of collective human grief or, or, or emotion or feeling. And um, she's also in some sense, the, the, the attitude of like the gods are sort of eternity and humanity is like, I, I'm sure you've seen, uh, uh, if you've seen Troy, there's a great line from ba Brad Pitt where he turns around and says, um, let me tell you a secret. The gods mm. envy us. They envy us because we are doomed. We will never be more beautiful than we are now. We will never be here again. That's what makes our life worth it. And then he, of course, pulls Priscilla. Uh, so if you want a pickup line, there you go. <laughs> there's your there's your clothes. Um, and that's actually something very, very interesting to think about is that these Olympians sit up here on Olympus getting smashed, observing, you know, from a distance. And we, as Achilles, are stuck there in this unideal reality. So these guys are up in the world of Apollo and ideals and perfection, and they know the plan, and they understand anything, and Juno's up here. And then we are down here in the chaos of reality, and it's, it's difficult. Our egos are getting wounded all the time. We're struggling through reality. And then they love us. They actually, not love, they kind of wish they could be like us. They wish they weren't so perfect. They wish they were more imperfect. And so much so that the, the ultimate reality, God, falls in love with human women often. And that's actually a fucking fascinating idea when you dig down into it, is that this cold, indifferent reality perhaps sort of wants us to, like, it, it, it may be in a more lusty way, like, loves us in that type of sense and that's how i start to see how christianity maps that idea as well because that's a difficult idea in christianity and um it's a very very interesting thought like it's something you can really sit with and just stew on for a long time and really start to think about it and then think about all right well why does zeus have this plan like what's going on with zeus's plan here and this is the same with christianity it's the same archetype if you will it might be the same god for all we know i don't really know but if you understand that he's in love with our experience maybe we're, we're i don't know <laughs> i'm sounding like a new age prophet here but like he's sort of living through us you can start to see that he might have crafted the destiny almost like an art piece and all the ups and downs are like the ups and downs in music it's something that actually makes sense to him like if you had everything perfect you would actually want a downside you would want dark scary notes you'd want dissonant notes you don't want like major chord, major chord, major chord, major chord. Beautiful music is tragic and then uplifting, tragic and uplifting. And so Zeus might be in that position where he, he, he's in love with our suffering because it's tragic and it gives meaning in that type of sense. That's a, that's a nuclear idea when you play with it. And I think that crosses the board across any decent religious conception. Like it is a juicy thought and it wraps into the idea of destiny because this destiny that we're all cursed to is a hard thing to justify if Zeus is the ultimate rational reality. But what if he's got some type of skin in the game? And then you can start thinking about Jesus again there as well. You always um, think about Jesus. By the way, just a, just a thought there. You mentioned sure. that there's, uh, there's your pickup line when Achilles in the movie uh, says that the gods envy us. We'll never be here again. We won't be uh, as beautiful again. And it's funny that ask any 
girl acquaintance you have, a woman who saw that movie as that, they genuinely love that scene because I mean, after actually Achilles makes a move and uh, I'm not giving pickup advice here because you shouldn't fornicate boys, but if you ever, <laughs> if you, if you ever want to test it, just ask them, do you want to watch Troy? Wait for that scene and make a move. Like, I'm not even kidding. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. It's, it's, it's a working recipe. <laughs> The boy, yes. Laszlo, Laszlo, if you, yeah, you're gonna send us all the hell as far as I understand. It's not on me, dudes. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I've gave my disclaimers, okay? My gave my I caveat. Just, I don't know about this now at all. You're sort of like, well, you know, like, don't tell you know Peter that it was me. Peter will be like, Laszlo, do you remember that time? <laughs> yeah, I have of- a rosary to do after this, so. <laughs> um. Yes. And uh, like that, again, like it's so important to get that drilled into your head about this is that I, I'm really trying to set up this idea that like uh, the Apollo, the, the idealism is ideal. And I'm so vulnerable to this, the perfect theory, the perfect story. And it does exist, but the experience of life is imperfection and tragedy. And that's, that's so fucking hard to manage, man. Like it's so difficult in our emotions to accept that our dreams are going to be crushed that we're not going to be able to, Achilles is, is given a choice, live a long life or be famous and glorious. And that's kind of like, you know, that's, that's, that's a difficult choice, man. That's a difficult choice. And the, the thing is, is that this is about exploring the, the emotional tragedy of that. It's not about, it's actually just not about giving you the answer. It's about saying, look, here's the experience. Cause maybe, maybe that's actually the most important part. And that's a, that's a great thing to think about. It's a great thing to bring you down to your roots. And it's, um, it becomes very moving and powerful when you work with it that way because it's, it's almost like an artistic way of understanding things. Like I get this out of music. Music is something that never has to explain itself to me, but it's more intelligent than almost everything I've ever explained to myself. Like I don't know how to say it. It's just, it just works. It's never perfect, but it, it, does, it just does something, that type of thing. Um, and so this is, I, I think I added this in because it's just kind of funny. Wife says, Jupiter, I can do nothing, but you suspect me and find it out. So he has this problem where he's, uh, he's always uh, going after the, the, the humanity because he loves them or he thinks they're hot. Well, whatever you wish. And uh, he, he's, uh, he watches Troy too much. And his part comes up and he's like, ah, Juno, I was sitting beside and like the movie came on. <laughs> um. And then there's this section where I, I can't see it properly. Forgive me, I lost it in the quotes, but he, he describes this cold face of Zeus. It must be back here. Um, I, I, yes, so here we go. Go back now, lest you should find out. I will consider the matter. I will bring it about as wish. See, I incline my head that you believe me. This is the most solemn that I can give any God. I never recall my word or deceive or fail to do what I say when I've nodded my head. So this is something that comes up in Nietzsche's second essay in genealogy of morals called, um, the, uh, I think it's called get bad conscience. And he talks about the ability to make promises, but this is actually a very interesting idea is that if, if you were the all powerful master of the world, you would never promise anything unless you could fulfill it. So if someone asked you for something, you'd be like, no, but if someone said, I, can I, you know, can I, uh, can I watch Troy with that chick? He'd be like, yes. And it would happen. And if you think about the nature of power, and this is, this is what um, Zeus is like, the, he's like the chieftain. He's like Agamemnon. He's like the top king. And the king would have the ability to make his word law. And ultimate reality is word as law, is everything fulfilled through your words. There is no way around it. Like promises get kept ultimate reality is very shockingly straightforward in that type of sense. It's a great thing to build yourself up against. And it actually gives you a little secret inclination how to build your mind a little bit more. Um, Like imagine, do this. Don't let your words ever be fake. Don't make promises you can't keep. You've heard that before. I, I still, for example, sometimes I'll say stuff like I might do that. And I still, I'm trying to crush that out of my language because that's weak language. Imagine if you just always like, yes or no. Imagine if you never promised anything unless you could do it to yourself. Imagine if you never said words unless you meant them. You know, imagine if you didn't put people down unless you were ready to face them in the ultimate reality of war. And this is where you start seeing something that, that in paganism people do criticize a lot is the deification of war. Because mm-hmm. war is actually a good thing. 
Now, why? You know, people are like, oh, because they're savages and they're aggressive. But it's like, no, because there's no hiding from war. Whoever wins in war wins because there's no rules in war except for the rules of reality. It's the naked truth of Zeus. And when you go into war and you fight each other, the winner takes it all. And there's no, there's no tricks. There's no cheating. It's straight up savagery. And there's something very cathartic about that, very spiritual about that, in that it is the perfect measure of greatness. It's the fair game, as fair as it can get. It may not be nice, but it's true. It's real. And that's, um, that's something quite interesting for the mind of a, a, a group, a people, because people, a people often drift from truth. And when they drift from truth, they need a smack. And if they're not careful, sometimes wars can be a reset. Wars can be a way to humble a huge amount of young men and, and, and mature a generation and whatnot. It's a very, very interesting idea. Um, hello? No, oh, we've got nothing. No, nope, um, we're all good, we're all good. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, yeah, they're, they're, I, I don't know who said it, but I believe there was someone who said something like, um, what is the most beautiful thing except for destruction? So... To, interesting yeah, interesting war is, war is the most beautiful thing except for destruction yes uh, no, except for the destruction so like oh, um, yes. the, the reality of the war is like exceptionally beautiful but the destruction is like the bad part of it so that's why we don't like it generally. <laughs> yes and, and it's even interesting because um like I, like, I would not want to live through World War II, neither would any of us. And nobody, nobody wanted to live through World War I or II because it's just, it's just a bloodbath. But mm. we watch movies and TV shows like that just with this reverence. Like, I, like you know, every, every boomer I know is just like, they just, they just always watch all the films. The male, sorry. Because it's just so interesting. Because they're like shit got real at that point. Like that was that was when things went down. Like that was that was a foundational touch point on the the, the heavy hardcore realities of the world. You know that's where that's where you know like imagine Stalingrad. Imagine the the scale of what must have happened in Russia across that eastern front. It's in just incomprehensible. The trenches in World War One. It's incomprehensible how serious that is. We're going through a global global movement probably second only to those experiences in terms of just mass organization and whatnot. And this is nothing compared to like that. Well, yet compared to like what that was, that, that stuff was just so crazy. And it's such an interesting thing to meditate your mind to. We talk about those virtues with the classical virtues. And it's very, very simple. It's that like, if a war came up, you, you, like as, as much as your ideal theories are, they would crumble in your hands into nothing and you'd be faced with a trench, and you'd very quickly see what you're made of and see how little you are in the scheme of things. It's a very, very fascinating thing to, to chew on, if you will. Um, all right, and so again, more, more Apollo, because Apollo is a fascinating myth here, and this is actually a huge part of this, because as I said, Achilles is the tragic figure of humanity, and what these guys are doing is they're destroying Troy. They're breaking Apollo. They're breaking Logos, and that's actually symbolic to the human experience is that it's almost like you can't have Apollo. You can't have logos and whatnot. And um, Apollo has an arrow and he shoots the pestilence. So he shoots everybody. Instead of Cupid, where you fall in love, you get the plague, which would be very shit. And um, there's some interesting ideas about this that I guess this is just more trivia. So um, I might brush over it quickly and we'll talk about it more later. But um, it, some people propose that he came from the East. And we'll talk about that now in a moment in regards to Christ. But other people think he uh, came from the North. So they think he, he came from Hyperborea, which is the land of the never, never setting sun. Yeah, like Odin there putting his hand up, being like, fuck yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, he, they, they believe he came from the land of the never setting sun, which is, of course, Scandinavia or something like that. Um, and he was, he was venerated as this, you know, this like everlasting youth. And of course, the Scandinavians look like the most youthful. Like, for example, I was blonde when I was a kid. So that's neoteny. Like I was, I was blonde. Most, most people, like a lot of people in Europe are blonde when they're younger. And you look at the Scandinavians, they all look like, you know, the, the blonde heads. You're like, are they all like giant babies? Because all of these are super tall as well. You look at any depictions of the Romans and they, they draw the, 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 the Nords, the Nords as like taller than them and all this. And you can imagine what they, these people would have seemed like. They're like very, very tall. They, all they do is drink milk and eat, eat and meat. 
and they are all like uh, athletic in great shape and like they look like giant children or something like that. Imagine if you came across these motherfuckers who are like, what? What is going on here? This is crazy stuff. And so again, it's this sort of idealism rooted into it is that, uh, do you know the way um, girls all dye their hair blonde these days? There's this natural innate um, desire for that youthful look, mm. that youthful look all around the place. And it's, um, it's, it's one of those, those things. It's like there's this idealism built into us in a weird way. And that's always very, very interesting because as I said, the, the neotenized version of the European, like I've, I've all dark hair now, but when I was younger, I had blonde hair. Apollo was also the eternal youth. He was a divine child. This is what Christ was as well. It's the same, same energy it's hitting on. Christ, like, I, I guess Christ probably had brownish black hair, but you look at some of the, the, the pictures of Christ and he's like blonde, golden, shining with like these light blue eyes. And you're kind of like, oh, <laughs> maybe because there's, there is some blue eyed people in the Levant, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. You wonder, you, you kind of wonder. But, you, see um, that in the, you see that in the geography of uh, um, the post-flood world, the descendants of Ham on the south and the descendants of Japheth in the north, and then the Shemites in the middle that Christ would descend yes, from. Yeah. So like the Dionysians in the south, the darker skin, and then kind of the super bright skinned people that you've just laid out. And yes. that played a lot part of the tension in the, the Old Testament there. Oh, did it? Interesting. Well, I yeah. Didn't yeah, like when, you know, the Israelites were, went down to Egypt in the place of bondage for Moses and then to free them back to the promised land in the center where Israel was. And uh, many of the tribes uh, that God said, yo, go fuck these guys up, stay away from these boyos, came from more southern geography. And like Sodom and Gomorrah was like down there too. So it's interesting. The geography played a role that most people don't really yeah. pay yeah, attention absolutely. to. The names are just names to them, you know. It's it's abs it's absolutely true, and and this is um something that I think any Lord of the Rings fans will find interesting about just this geography stuff, is that um Apollo is an elf if you think about it, like mm. where the the north the north elf came from the the, the Norse mythological elf was the the arrow holding Legolas. Think of Legolas in Lord of the Rings, like he's essentially what Apollo is, you know. And it's it's that type of thing. It's this sort of a uh, ideal. I have a couple of friends like this, and they're they're just so funny because they're like super tall. And blonde hair they just have those genes and you're kind of like looking up standing up with them you're like man you look like a supermodel like what the fuck's going on here like it's just one of those it's like unfair you're like dude give me give me whatever you have give me some of that stuff i go to clubs with them and um in ireland there's a lot of brazilians and like the brazilian girls are just like <laughs> they just love them like they're just absolutely they're like that's the perfect man oh my god tall blonde looks like legolas that type of thing and um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. And, and this, this stuff is a very, very big deal. Yes, because of the divine child and whatnot. So it, it, Apollo represented uh, youth. So what, what is more ideal than youth? Youth, beauty, health, like all these things, all the good stuff wrapped up together, youth, beauty, health, and these type of things. And then so Apollo was this good looking young dude, neodonized, that type of energy. And this is like the redeeming energy of the world. This is the opposite of plague. This is the opposite of destruction, death, and negativity. This is the opposite. This is the consequence of order, civility, obeying the logos. This is the good thing. This is what you want. And um, we, we've talked about this quite a lot. What, what happens in the world is that the world gets stale and old. The boomers take over. And then what happens is the youth get crushed with debt slavery. And then the youth gets strangled and they can't let out their youthful energy. And the world gets dark and sterile and gray and, 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 and ashen. And what happens is there needs to be this, this um, redemption experience. And that's when the divine child comes back. And this is a super common theme throughout mythology. It's the end of Stanley Kubrick's 2001. It's in uh, Endgame by Samuel Beckett. There's a Greek myth called Kronos. And uh, Kronos is eating his children. Kronos is the god of time. Saturn is the god of time. He eats his children. So you, the, the old generation eats his children. <laughs> the student debt slavery like that type of thing mm. he, he extracts the energy out of them it's like this creepy child sacrifice thing he's eating them there's some horrible pictures online of it and then zeus his wife tricks him and zeus gets born zeus is the divine child who strikes him down we've talked about this before and establishes the new order that type of thing he rejuvenates the world he redeems the world he saves the world and as <laughs> boyos are genuinely here to save the world, that type of juice. That's the type of reality that's coming on. And it's, 
Like it is most certainly a meme and we're not like trying to do a cult or anything, but it's something to keep in mind. Like I'm talking about archetypes here is that the eternal youth is actually an archetype that you need to be correctly aligned with. Like, I don't know, I've never been old, but there, there is a part, there's a, a part of the human experience where an old person resents the young, you know? Like you see a young dude and part of you is like, oh, the young dude, it'd be nice to talk to him. But it's like sometimes, and I felt this, you're kind of like, fuck that lucky prick. I'm jealous. I wish I was that young again. I wish I could be that young. Again. I wish I could experience that again. And they're the little dark emotions that most certainly are there at scale. And that's the little war. And the thing is, is that this eternal youth, you actually have to give room to it. It's like the logos. You have to give room to it to let it flourish because it will help. It will make things better, but you will want to crush it because you're evil and bad and whatnot. Um, gents, I'm going to definitely wrap this up now because of, I'm start literally talking about elves at this point, like I've, I've been here too much. Um, <laughs> So very, 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 uh, basically like we talked about all that stuff. That's all rage, all that stuff, grief, the stress, anger, and tragedy. A very, very interesting idea is that Achilles probably means the rage of sorrow. That's an interesting idea. As we're talking about ultimate reality is harsh. When you adapt to reality, it hurts you. It's tragic and you get angry about it. And that's the human challenge is that it's, it actually sucks to be human. And that's the beauty of it. And Achilles is the representation of that the pain of life and the fury that we attack life and that's actually a justifiable thing in the scheme of things according to this book and so like if you go underneath anger this is a very emotional truth get underneath anger you'll almost always find sadness you'll almost find weakness someone's afraid trying to hide something and that's okay and, and anger is a good thing because it protects you from getting wounded but there's vulnerability underneath it um so it's something to think about and then the uh, last thing in civility as i said the, the Trojans and the Romans, Apollo, did not like all this stuff. And um, they thought Achilles was a savage. And they saw themselves as Apollyon's beings of light. Rome actually considered themselves the Trojans. If you watch the film, the guys escaping at the end, apparently they were the first Romans. Um, and that's all very, very interesting. And then what's finally interesting is the Eastern origin of Apollo as well. So it's sort of North and East. He's a foreigner generally. And what eventually happens to the Europeans is they take in Jesus. And in Rome, Jesus was competing with Mithras, who was also a Persian, another foreign god of some sort. And again, they were looking for a savior archetype. And you start to see that in the center of this, um, this idealistic religious worldview is this fundamental archetype, the savior. This is the centerpiece of this conceptual worldview. And Achilles is like you your fallen tragic nature and your interaction with this savior. Now, this is a far more savage way of describing it because it's more justifying towards egotistical Achilles, which is fair. You need to look at it this way from time to time. Nietzsche drew a huge amount of his ideas from this. He believed the people completely lost touch with the, the wisdom in these, these ideas. Like it is hard to live your life ideal. You need to have a way of emotionally engaging with its shitness you know it's his imperfection but at the same time that slot you need to have that belief in the ideal it's a, it's a tension you know you need to have apollo you need to have dionysus and so mithras jesus christ apollo these are all this these these oscillating around this archetype and perhaps lazo will tell you which one is sitting on the throne that's all for <laughs> me gents um that, it, so that if, really lazo, do, I, I do you want to run in yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I won't uh, like take a deep dive into Gerard. Maybe I have some finishing thoughts um, on the Iliad that I literally just thought of because this was so good. I didn't know what to because I haven't seen this before. You know, so I just have a few finishing thoughts on this. That would be a great segue into Gerard, mm. and uh, and maybe we can unpack that on the next one. Okay, but I'll I'll, I'll drop a few um, interesting stuff out there. So first of all, with the with the Iliad, so. There's a line on, on, on this particular slide that I, can see, that I can see that this is why these stories are so powerful. They paint the problem so good because they realized that there was a problem. So even Homer, so he says, this is 700 BC. So Homer says, tell me about a complicated man, Muse. Tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy. So this whole idea of there is something perfect, there is something holy, and we're, we're wrecking it. There is a problem. And if you look at the whole uh, Iliad, so there are glorious war scenes in that, you know, literally going 
chapters after chapters. And it does point to an issue, though, with the tension between glory and the beauty of battle and young men dying. You can see when there's a description about a young man, a warrior, uh, Homer gives you a rundown about his ancestors, what he was doing back in Greece, and he literally dies in a second. You know, no glory, no beauty. And then this whole thing unfolds. The Greeks definitely identified the problem that there is war, there is violence, blood is flowing, you know, and even glory and honor is an attempt at kind of, uh, uh, kind of um, sanctifying that, you know. But then the problem still exists, and, and there's an interesting uh, peak in the plot. So how does the whole story end? There is the battle, it goes on, and then we have Achilles killing Hector. But he doesn't just kill Hector, but he actually desecrates his corpse. He doesn't allow Priam, the king of the Trojans, to bury his son. He actually drags the body away on his chariot and leaves it to rot in the sun. And there is this whole idea about Achilles trying to alleviate his pain. He lost his brother. He lost his friend. And he's going on this rage. He defeats the greatest the hero of the Trojans. You know, he desecrates his body. He sacrifices, I don't know how many Trojan soldiers on a pyre as well. And nothing really gives him peace. He's still pissed. And then one night, like a man in a cloak shows up in his tent and it's Priam. And Priam says that, look, I stand before you. Priam kisses Achilles. There I kissed the murderer of my son. Yeah. And I beg you, I beg you to give his body back to me so I can bury him. So there's all this thing going on. Literally like the tens of thousands of soldiers dying. War stretches on for 10 years. All these glorious stories. And all Priam cares about is a dead body. You know, just the opportunity to bury that body. And Achilles, first of all, is struck by his courage. So he, he, he admires the courage. But then that's the moment when he sees for the first time Hector as his brother. So there's kind of like some sort of a paradigm shift there because he takes pity, like Achilles, Achilles takes pity on Priam. That's like literally the, the, the escalation of the story. That's the pinnacle of the story. He takes pity, he gives the body back and literally like the whole book ends with the line and so the trojans buried hector breaker of horses that's the last sentence of the iliad it's about burial what is burial why is it so significant why is it so important like people are dying people live like what's about a course a, a corpse and this whole idea about dignity human dignity you know that's something that we only found recently we had attempts at kind of articulating that the greeks definitely tried they definitely glimpsed that there is something there's a problem with war there is violence it is going on and for some reason we care about things like pity and dignity and what really got into my head with regards to the uh, girardian theories is like, how does it all start? Because in the, in the story, there could be so many reasons for the war to break out. You know, it can be about, I don't know, someone murdering someone and it's a revenge story. Or it can be about whatever. But what, like, why it breaks out is because of Helen, Helen of Troy. And the whole story behind the Helen of Troy, uh, Helen of Troy is Paris, actually uh, with Athena, they decide that Athena is the most beautiful of the gods. And in exchange for that, Paris gets the most beautiful woman on earth. But Paris, actually, he's a Trojan prince. And in, in the story, he's pretty handsome. He can't get anyone, you know. But who he needs is the most beautiful woman on earth, the woman who everyone desires. This, that's the point. So how does that fit into Girard? Girard's idea, the whole mimetic desire idea, is that actually all of our violence, all the violence in history st stems from mimetic desire. Mimetic desire is the desire that I want that thing, not only because I have some genuine, authentic desire in me, but ultimately I want things because, because others want it. And if I want something and someone else also wants it, I am justified and confirmed in my desire. And the whole thing just escalates. So 
we keep wanting the same thing that uh, causes friction, that causes conflict, which leads to violence. And that violence just keeps building tension in the community. So the, the Iliad got that right, which is absolutely fascinating to me that from all the reasons they chose like the perfect representation of mimetic desire, which gives me the chills. And the whole idea about Gerard, and we can talk about that next time. So the whole idea there is that there is this mimetic desire. The, the tension is building that leads to conflict that leads to violence. So in order to control that, in order to keep that in check, because we can just go around murdering each other, but in order to keep that in check, <laughs> We try to manage that in a way that we choose scapegoats from the community. It can be a person. It can be another nation. It can be, it, the only thing is that it's an other. And ideally, it's someone who, I don't know, who stole something or some, like we can actually blame some, something on them. So kind of to direct that violence. And then we can just basically let the steam out. And this is the idea of sacrifice. So this is what religion started to uh, kind of define and, and articulate as sacrifice, like a dream, you know, like, like in a dream, you can see things that you cannot really put your finger on just yet, but some sort of a vision is coming to you. Now, that's what religion did with this whole mechanism. So the, the problem is that there is a mimetic desire leads to violence. So we choose a scapegoat, who we sacrifice so we can unite as a group, you see? So we sacrifice, so we're not him, and we are now unified, and the whole act of violence unifies us as a group. And basically, um, the idea here is that all myths, all ancient myths, are actually based on this, on this founding murder. So when these sacrifices took place, then after that, after that, the myths kind of built on those sacrifices and they deified the, uh, the, the victims. So all, all foundation stories is like the good ordering principle God kills the bad chaos God, for example. But then the uh, thesis of Girard is that these are actually based on real life events. And then the myth builds on it, conflates it, and then recontextualizes it so that the perpetrators can actually live with themselves. So they can actually justify what they've done. And that's a founding myth. It's a brilliant, like huge idea. And then how that leads to Christ, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> but, but basically what happens is that you have these myths and it's going on in history. It's a problem because we can see, because we already started to articulate it, but it's a problem. We still sacrifice and it escalates. So even if you think about Rome, it's a perfect example because Rome, this beautiful empire, they've created order you know, out of chaos, literally, they created all this beauty, this architecture, that knowledge, that poetry, it's, it's objectively beautiful, but they had to do it at the price of ruthless violence. That was the price that they needed to pay for. And they decided, and, and look, I mean, you can have your opinion, uh, there was order, okay? And, and they still had to impose that with violence. And what happened is that Christianity is just another myth in a way that it uses all the same patterns. You know, it has all the same mythical patterns. You even have the dying and resurrecting God. That's not new. That's not really original. It's as, that, it's as old as it gets. But the difference is that even though it's just another myth, it's a myth where the whole frame, the whole perspective changes because it's the first myth and the only myth that is told from the viewpoint of the victim, okay? So actually, in the center of the story, you have a victim. And he is, as the story goes, so now actually with this whole thing, we can let go of metaphysics. You don't need to believe that he was the son of God or even that he resurrected. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, okay? But, <laughs> but, you, know, <laughs> but, you, don't but you don't have to. So you can just look at that man, that prophet, that teacher, exposing that mechanism through simply being innocent, so being perfect, all he did, basically, I mean, even those who hate him, they don't say that, I don't know, he was a bad man, you know, maybe he was a misguided fool, um, or he was just, you know, innocent, or maybe ineffective, whatever you think. I mean, everyone has something to, to say about Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, 
um, you can say that he was just a good man. He was a perfect man. He didn't uh, uh, commit atrocities or even crimes. And he was sacrificed. He was stripped naked. He was flayed alive. And he was nailed on a cross to die a torturous death. And this is historical fact. Again, those who hate him, those who love him, everyone says this is like the, one of the most well-documented, actually the most, uh, the, the best documented event in ancient history. That happened. Now, what that actually did functionally in history, that it exposed the mechanism, which means that we can't do it anymore because when we know what's going on, it doesn't work. So it only works if we can kind of, uh, lull ourselves into that illusion that um, uh, we're doing the right thing, that we're actually, this whole thing, uh, this tool that we're using, the scapegoating mechanism, it's not that. It's actually like we're doing a good thing. We are, sacrif we, we are just getting rid of a criminal. And what Jesus Christ did is that he, he by being who he was, by having the, the whole thing documented, we can just see that this mechanism is real, regardless of what you think about even morality. The mechanism works like that. And his theory, Gerard's theory, is that the 2,000 years after Christ, this is actually humanity trying to grapple with this revelation, trying to grapple with the fact that we can't use the scapegoating mechanism as we used to. Because we can, because even war is like that. Like a, uh, a leader can tell his people that, hey, the Taiwanese, or I don't know, the Irish, they stole our women, so we need to go. So fuck the Irish. Now, it's getting more and more difficult with being interconnected. Carefully. <laughs> so being interconnected, you see, it makes propaganda difficult. So it's like, imagine if I wanted to now, if I was the leader of Hungary, and I said that we're going to attack the Irish, now, it wouldn't be that easy as it was, you know, because people would actually speak with the Irish. We see them on the internet. We have, so, so there's a way of communicating. I can't really phoneticize them. I can though, maybe if I close the information off. So I go totalitarian. So that actually leaves us, as you see, with options that doesn't let us to, to let off the steam, you know, because you can either go to a totalitarian or you, uh, you can try and phoneticize people, which doesn't work anymore. And this is why uh, Girard actually has apocalyptic visions because this tool kept us together for such a long time and revelation took it away from us. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that, you know, and, and, and maybe we can unpack that next time. That was, that was a brilliant presentation. I haven't heard uh, Girard, uh, you, you got to go. I, don't know. I, don't uh, I will have to go soon. So I only have like five minutes. Okay, sweet. Um, we we'll stop this and, and do do uh, questions now in a moment. But uh, look, everybody on YouTube, that was that was great, Lazo. I'd love to talk about that a bit more now in a moment. Um, everybody on YouTube, uh, if if this goes up on YouTube, sound quality is. I don't know why I'm telling you this. This is just for the people here. But anyway, that's that's uh, the Iliad and Gerard, and you see the violence and rage of Achilles and how it uh, spreads into some very very interesting theories about memetics and the violence. And it's just an absolutely brilliant foundational book. The, the reason why I wanted to hit this is that if you understand this story and you understand the Greek myth, as I said, psychological grounding, it also bridges very well into Christianity and almost like acts as the root of the, the metaphysical psychological tree that you can actually start to archetypically build your, your mind around or, or just look at these things and let them clash up against your mind and see how your mind adapts to them, you know? So um, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, like, comment, subscribe, all the stuff you're supposed to do. Do all that stuff. <laughs> say, say hello to the boys. They're all very fucking handsome. It's like Olympus up here. They're all like staring down. Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. There's <laughs> Greek Apollo, Slovenian Apollo, German Apollo. Odin's here. I don't know where he came from, but he's <laughs> hanging around. And of course, we've got a barbarian Hungarian telling us that we've got to end the cycle of violence by invading the west i don't know what that's all about for the love of god <laughs> the love of god <laughs> all right people thank you very much and i'll talk to you later bye 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 thank you bye bye